Um, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here at Evergreen, Rachel Corey's college. Uh, I'll give a PowerPoint and then we'll have a discussion. I'd like to dedicate this presentation to Rachel Corey's inspiring memory. Uh, our late Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish said, the kernels of a dying ear of wheat will fill the valley with many ears. The BDS movement is based on a basic uh, uh, principle that to end all violence, one must fight the root causes of violence, that is oppression, thus BDS. The boycott, divestment and sanctions movement today is a global movement that is led by the largest coalition in Palestinian civil society and it's anchored in universal human rights. It's based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. As the late Edward Said said, equality or nothing, Palestinians cannot compromise beneath equality. <coughs> equality is the absolute minimum. We can accept equal rights to all other human beings. BDS was launched mainly because the international community under US hegemony <laughs> was unable or unwilling uh, to help Palestinians achieve our basic rights under international law. So we resorted to what South Africans did before us, to the international community, civil society, to help us achieve our rights. A quick, very quick history of Palestine, where we stand today. The map to your leftmost is the historic Palestine, pre-1948. And then the UN partition plan, the next map, which would have had a so-called Jewish state and a so-called Arab state. The yellow part would have been the so-called Arab state and the white one, the Jewish state. In effect, uh, 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 Zionist militias and later the state of Israel managed to ethnically cleanse a majority of the Palestinians and established the state of Israel on the entire white area on the third map, leaving the West Bank and Gaza, which were occupied later in 1967. And then the rightmost map is the situation today, where you have yellow patches of Palestinian communities completely surrounded by Israel, Israeli-controlled areas. The, 19, the 2005 BDS call issued by Palestinian civil society called for three basic rights without which Palestinians cannot exercise self-determination. Ending the occupation of 1967, which includes the wall, the colonies, and so on, Ending Israel's system of racial discrimination, which meets the UN definition of apartheid, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute, and recognizing the Palestinian refugees' right of return. The reason why we focused on all three rights, not just ending the occupation, which mo most people understand, is because the Palestinian people are not just those living in the 1967 occupied territory, in Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. In fact, the Palestinian people are divided into three main parts. Only 38%, the, the red part, 38% of the Palestinian people live in Gaza and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. 12% are Palestinian citizens of the State of Israel, and a whole 50%, the yellow part, 50% of the Palestinian people live in exile, not allowed to go home simply because they're the wrong type. So anyone interested in human rights uh, on principle would support the basic rights of all three communities, not just the Palestinians in the occupied territories. The BDS movement, as I said, is a global movement led by the largest coalition in Palestinian society called the BDS National Committee, which includes all the major trade unions, political parties, women's unions, students, youth, and so on and so forth. We're also very proud of the support we have from within Israeli society. Uh, boycott from within, an Israeli group that has supported BDS since 2009, the Coalition of Women for Peace, ICAD, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolition, and other and other groups that, in Israel that have come out in support of, of BDS. And they play a very important role in the economic boycott, the cultural boycott, the academic boycott, and so on, despite their small numbers. So, the three basic rights uh, 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 concern the three main injustices that Palestinians are suffering from. The 1967 occupied territory is the easiest to understand because you hear about that more in the media. 
but it's no longer just an occupation, not even just a prolonged occupation. Israel's occupation of the West Bank and Gaza today encompasses many uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity, like the siege of Gaza that's been going on since 2007, building illegal settlements in the occupied territories, which is a war crime under international law, and gradual, continuous ethnic cleansing, especially in the Jerusalem area and the Jordan Valley area. The devastation of Gaza in Israel's repeated massacres, especially the last massacre 2014, the summer 2014, last year, uh, is another very brutal aspect of Israel's occupation that, that should be remembered. And of course, Israel's wall, which is literally a concrete form of oppression. Uh, Israel's uh, denying Palestinians the right to access water in so-called Area C of the West Bank, the most fertile area of the West Bank, uh, as a means of expulsion, as Amnesty International said in a 2009 report. So even using water as a weapon uh, is known under the occupation. Uh, today, we're also suffering from an extreme uh, rise in uh, fanatic Jewish fundamentalism, which has gone absolutely mainstream in Israel. Uh, a lot of people are focused on Islamic fundamentalism, forgetting what's happening with Jewish fundamentalism in Israel, which is not any less dangerous, given that Israel is a nuclear power, of course. And some of the main rabbis today in Israel are advocating genocide openly. It's in, it's in the mainstream media, in the Knesset, in universities, in the media, people talk about genocide against the Palestinians uh, um, as, as something normal to do. Uh, taking Palestinians as human shields, even children, as happened with this boy where, where they tied his arm to the jeep so that uh, no one would throw stones at the military jeep is, is a common practice for the Israeli army. So that's the occupy, occupation part, the 1967 part. The apartheid part is, is no less important, but it's hardly ever discussed, especially in your so-called media. Um, since the 1948 Nakba, the systematic ethnic cleansing, the premeditated ethnic cleansing of the majority of Palestinians from historic Palestine to create a Jewish majority state in their stead. Since the Nakba, uh, the, as I said, the largest population of Palestinians have been refugees. Other than the 50% of the Palestinians outside historic Palestine, that's the state of Israel, the West Bank and Gaza, even among Palestinians in the occupied territories and in Israel, there's a large minority of internally displaced persons, IDPs. So together, Palestinian refugees form a very large uh, part of the Palestinian uh, people. But those who remained in the 1948 territory and became citizens of the state of Israel are living under what can be accurately described as an apartheid regime. Uh, am I saying that Israel and South Africa are identical? Absolutely not. Apartheid is not just a South African crime. It's defined in the 1973 International Convention for the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid. That's a UN convention. The crime of apartheid applies academically, very accurately to what Israel has. Israel does not just practice racial discrimination. Every country practices racial discrimination, including yours, obviously. But Israel has laws. 50 plus laws that discriminate against its non-Jewish citizens, the indigenous Palestinians, whether they're Muslim, Christians, or others. Uh, um, those laws apply in many, many vital domains of life, education, health, uh, uh, public services, and so on and so forth. That's what makes Israel an apartheid state on top of being an occupation and a settler colonial system. Even the UN came very close to recognizing that. The UN Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination in March 2012 said that Israel was in violation of the prohibition against apartheid. A very convoluted way to say Israel is guilty of apartheid. But the political will is not there yet to come out with that uh, strong statement. South African Christian leaders have also reached that conclusion. In fact, they said Israeli apartheid in its practical manifestation is even worse than South African apartheid, even worse. One aspect of Israeli apartheid is land ownership, the most important aspect, where 93% of the land controlled by Israel is uh, only for Jewish use. 
non-Jews are not allowed to buy, rent, or live on 93% of the land. And they achieve this percentage through very complex, a very complex system of, of uh, uh, discrimination, the Jewish National Fund and other mechanisms through which they deny Palestinians access to the land. So we talked about the occupation aspect of the injustice, uh, and we talked about the apartheid aspect. The third part, the most important part, is the denial of refugee rights. As I said, between the refugees outside Palestine and the refugees inside Palestine, the IDPs, internal displaced persons, 69% of the Palestinian people are refugees, which makes the right of return the absolute most important right for the Palestinian people. The BDS movement is very much inspired by the South African struggle against apartheid, by the civil rights movement in the United States, and by anti-colonial struggles like Gandhi-led struggle in India. But it's first and foremost an authentic, rooted, contemporary, nonviolent Palestinian popular and civil resistance. It's very much rooted in a long heritage of Palestinian nonviolent resistance, which again you don't hear much about in your so-called media. The roots of Palestinian popular resistance go as far back as the 20s and the 30s with the mass demonstrations and boycott against British mandate and Zionist companies which discriminated against Palestinians, so Palestinians boycotted their products in, in return. Education was always part of our resistance, which is hardly ever talked about. Uh, Israel has systematically denied our right to education, our access to education, uh, through many, many, many policies, including attacking, physically attacking universities and schools, shutting down universities for years on end, as was done in the first Intifada, 1987 to 1993, where universities were shut down for four consecutive years. Imagine. And then all the schools were shut down. Even kindergartens were shut down. Palestinian education at, at that stage went underground, literally. And if a teacher was held teaching a class, he or she was subjected to severe punishment, including imprisonment. So education has always been part of our resistance. Literature, poetry, music, dance have also been part of Palestinian nonviolent resistance to Israel's regime of occupation, apartheid, and settler colonialism. So the BDS movement calls for freedom, justice, and equality. And it has reached a new height after Israel's last massacre in Gaza in the summer of 2014. A lot of cross-movement work has happened, has always happened, but especially after Israel's latest attack on Gaza, connecting the Palestinian struggle with other progressive struggles around the world, including in Ferguson in the United States, be went, uh, became very popular became much more talked about. The connections between Palestine and other forms of oppression, domestic oppression or international oppression. Some of the uh, big achievements that happened after, for the BDS movement after Israel's massacre in Gaza 2014 was the South Africa's ruling alliance, which is led by the ANC, endorsed BDS. President Evo Morales of Bolivia also joined many intellectuals and politicians and MPs across Latin America who've endorsed BDS. During the attack on Gaza, five Latin American states withdrew their ambassadors from Tel Aviv. Leicester in the UK joined four towns in Scotland and 12 in Turkey in declaring a boycott of Israeli goods. 100 international figures, including six Nobel laureates, peace laureates, called for a full military embargo on Israel, a very important demand of the BDS movement. Another aspect of BDS is the economic boycott, of course, a very important aspect, which has become much more mainstream in 2014. And I'll give some examples. Very important among these successes was the spread of the boycott of Israeli goods in the occupied territories. Many of you who've been to the occupied territories have always said, you're asking us to boycott in Olympia or in Washington while Palestinians in Ramallah and Bethlehem are not boycotting. Isn't that kind of hypocritical? Actually, it's not hypocritical. Living under a system of oppression, you've got to deal with that system. And sometimes you have to buy things that there are no alternatives to. In Olympia, you have alternatives. You can. It's a moral choice to boycott or not to boycott. For a Palestinian in Bethlehem, if all the tomatoes they can get are Israeli, they cannot 
except by those tomatoes. Despite Israel's systematic destruction of the Palestinian economy and, and prevention of the development of, of agriculture and industry, Palestinians today, especially after the, the massacre in Gaza, have adopted boycotts, selective boycotts of major Israeli companies uh, to which there are alternatives. Also, during the attack on Gaza, Kuwait uh, excluded Veolia, uh, a very complicit company uh, that's involved in Israeli violations of human rights, excluded it from two projects worth $2.25 billion and started taking action against 50 companies that are helping Israel in the settlement industry. Veolia, in fact, has lost $26 billion worth of contracts since we launched the campaign against it in November 2008. So that's one of the biggest targets of the BDS movement and certainly one of the biggest losers. Um, also during Gaza, Avaz launched a, a kind of a BDS uh, uh, appeal that calls on CEOs of ABP, HP, Veolia, Barclays and Caterpillar, as well as G4S, uh, to end their involvement in Israel's occupation. 1.8 million people signed that petition, which sent shockwaves across some of those companies and some of the boards of directors of those companies. Um, and the, the petition said that mo major corporations should end complicity in Israel's occupation and repression of the Palestinian people. HP is one of the companies that were really alarmed by that Avaz uh, uh, success. The huge online shopping site Gilt dropped Ahava <coughs> after a coat pink campaign. Ahava is an Israeli cosmetics company that manufactures uh, uh, in the occupied territory, in a settlement in the occupied territory, using pillaged uh, uh, material, minerals from the Dead Sea. And of course, block the boat. The, the big success during Gaza was to block Israeli boats from docking in US ports, especially on the West Coast, and especially uh, Oakland, California. That was a, a very, very important development. For four consecutive days, activists, unionists, managed to prevent uh, Zim, an Israeli ship, from docking in, in the port of Oakland. So that was a new phase in the struggle. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, after an intense BDS campaign, uh, divested their entire investment in G4S, $182 million. G4S is a British Danish security company, the largest, the largest security company in the world that's, uh, that has contracts with the Israeli prison system, checkpoints, settlements, and so on. And of course, as you know, in Israeli prison systems, Palestinians are tortured, including hundreds of Palestinian child prisoners. So after we presented all the facts to the Gates Foundation, and after some pressure, they did divest from G4S. One of the biggest successes in 2014 was, and this is before Gaza, was PGGM, the Dutch pension fund giant, $200 billion worth of investments around the world, divested from all Israeli banks involved in the occupation. That's the top five Israeli banks. So now we're not just talking about little companies here and there, we're talking about Israeli banks, a pillar of the system of oppression. The Norwegian pension fund, one of the largest in the world, divested from two Israeli companies also involved in the occupation. Danske Bank, the largest bank in Denmark, ended its relationship with Bank Hapoalim, one of the largest banks in Israel, over its involvement in the occupation. The Luxembourg pension fund also pulled out of all Israeli banks, as well as some companies also involved in the occupation. Some large European construction companies uh, uh, pulled out of a contract of a bidding process to build two private ports uh, in Israel because of fear of the boycott, as Haaretz said. Israel's apartheid water company, Mekorot, lost a $170 million contract in Argentina because it pillages Palestinian water resources. SodaStream, one of the most famous BDS campaigns, simply because ScarJo was involved in it, um, they thought by hiring her to do their PR, they would you know, kill the BDS campaign against them. In fact, she and they lost. Uh, uh, and she did us some great favor, actually. She put BDS right in the middle of the mainstream. So we, we need to send her a box of chocolates. Um, 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 due to the BDS campaign against SodaStream, which manufactures in the occupied territory and, and is involved in, in various violations of human rights, uh, the SodaStream uh, stock price has really dipped, has really plummeted 
throughout 2014, and they lost a lot of market share, especially in the United States. They lost more than 40% of their market share in the US. Another very important aspect of the BDS movement is the academic and cultural boycott. It's not just economic. In fact, the economic aspects came last. We, we had a lot of academic and cultural boycott successes leading to the economic, and they're very tied up because we're targeting the brand Israel in the academic and cultural boycott, and it's the brand that matters. As that's one of the lessons we learned from the South African anti-apartheid movement, which we're in, in regular touch with uh, some of its leaders, uh, um, you've got to attack the brand. When South Africa under apartheid had a good brand, it was selling its products. When the anti-apartheid movement managed to tarnish the brand to show South Africa for what it is, a racist colonial society, then people would see Made in South Africa and stay away from it. I don't want to buy this. It's, it sounded bad to buy something from South Africa. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. Today, across Europe, consumers are staying away from anything that says product of Israel. So Israel is cheating, sometimes selling its products as product of Spain or product of God knows where, just to sell because they're having a more difficult time selling in some parts of Europe, especially Norway, Denmark, and other places. The academic uh, associations, especially in the United States, adopting a full academic boycott of Israel was perhaps one of the most uh, important, the most significant BDS successes to date. Um, of course, the American Studies Association was the most famous and was very hotly contested in the media and so on, but it wasn't the first. The Association for Asian American Studies was the first in the world, the first academic association in the world to adopt a full academic boycott of Israel. That's a boycott of all Israeli universities, institutions, not individuals, because we do not call for boycotting individuals. We call for boycotting institutions. And it was followed by the ASA, the African Literature Association, the National Women's Studies Association, Critical Ethnic Studies, and many, many others. MESA, the Middle East Studies Association, is, is not there yet, but they're debating a BDS resolution. And students have led the growth of BDS in North America, in Canada and the United States in particular. Uh, the latest successes we had at Stanford, and that was a very difficult battle, as you know, as you might expect in Stanford, UCLA, Northwestern University, and many others were before then. Uh, UC Berkeley, UC Davis, UC Santa Cruz, uh, uh, San Diego, and, and so on, University of Toronto, where student councils passed divestment resolutions. So we're not talking yet about universities actually uh, adopting divestment. We're talking about student councils adopting divestment. And of course, Evergreen was before all of these, I think. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we need to see an implementation of this. More pressure on the trustees, on the boards, to, to actually withdraw from companies involved in the occupation. Also in 2014, the National Union of Students, which has 7 million members. I know something to envy. In the UK, they have those big, huge unions. You only wish you had one. Um, 7 million members in the National Stud Student Union in the UK. The executive passed a full BDS resolution uh, a few months ago. More than 1,000 anthropologists, mainly in the United States, but elsewhere as well, also called for a full academic boycott of Israel last year. 1,200 scholars in Spain signed on academic boycott. The Teachers Union of Ireland unanimously voted at their General Assembly for a full academic boycott of Israel, but they're Irish, so that's expected. <laughs> Stephen Hawking, uh, perhaps the most uh, um, significant scientist alive, uh, also heeded our call for a boycott and, and canceled his participation in an Israeli presidential conference, sending shockwaves across the hard science community. You know, it's some, one thing to get the liberal arts communities to support BDS, completely different game to get the hard science community to consider such a political thing. I'm an engineer, so I would know. Uh, the University of Johannesburg in 2011 became the first university outside the Arab world to sever links with an Israeli university over its involvement in the occupation. <coughs> Israeli Apartheid Week which is coming up, I think, on this campus next month, uh, is, is now a global phenomenon. Uh, it started at the University of Toronto, 
just one university in 2005. And today, Israeli Apartheid Week is, is a week of events across the world in more than 200 cities, many, many, many universities across the world, including some Israeli universities, by the way, uh, uh, raising awareness about Israel's apartheid policies and laws and uh, um, pushing for endorsement of BDS. The cultural boycott has played a very significant role in the overall BDS movement. I'll just quickly pass through some of the examples. Danny Glover, of course, became the first Hollywood star to endorse BDS last year. Just recently, a few days ago, 1,000 UK artists pledged to support the cultural boycott of Israel. Those include Harry Potter fame, Miriam Margolis, uh, uh, the former president of Penn UK, Gillian Slovo, of course, Roger Waters, uh, Pink Floyd, Mike Lee, one of the most famous British filmmakers who happens to be Jewish, and others and others, John Berger and others. 1,000 UK artists. Uh, this was preceded by Irish artists. The Irish always come first. Um, 500 plus Irish artists signed on the cultural boycott of Israel. Also in Montreal, they were the first actually, Montreal, Canada, where more than 500 artists signed uh, three, four years ago a cultural boycott of Israel, and then South Africa, and then Ireland, and then the UK. We hope to see the US soon. 640 Swiss artists called for cutting military trade with Israel. And in the US, some very important cultural figures like Huna Diaz, Chuck D of Public Enemy, and Boots Riley have, in, have endorsed the cultural boycott of Israel. Several major artists have canceled performances in Israel. So some of them came out and said we support BDS. Some of them just canceled performances, including Snoop Dogg, uh, uh, Vanessa Paradis of, of France, uh, the late Gil Scott Heron, Elvis Costello, uh, uh, and others. Alice Walker, of course, is one of the most important cultural figures to support BDS. And she famously said Rosa Parks would have also supported BDS. Mira Nair the famous Indian-American filmmaker uh, endorsed in 2014 a full cultural boycott of Israel. And Judith Butler, the Jewish-American uh, philosopher, feminist, uh, uh, queer theorist, is one of the foremost academic supporters of BDS. Angela Davis as well, who said it's not the image of the Israeli government that needs changing, but rather it's racist and repressive policies and practices of apartheid. During the attack on Gaza, we saw some real action in Spain, not yet BDS, but Penelope Cruz, Javier Bardem, and a hundred other very famous top Spanish artists condemned, quote unquote, Israel's genocide in Gaza. Even in the US, Viggo Mortensen condemned Israel's state terrorism, quote unquote, in Gaza. So they're not BDS yet, but very, very close. Uh, and all this has helped to tarnish the brand Israel, which I mentioned earlier. In fact, Brand Israel is a campaign launched by the Israeli Foreign Ministry in 2005, mainly as, uh, as Israel's main uh, attack on BDS. It wasn't yet a, a full BDS, it was the academic and cultural boycott, and they started rebranding Israel. So Israel, according to the research, was associated with violence, occupation, religious uh, uh, extremism, and so on and so forth. They wanted to rebrand, to present Israel as a haven for democracy, nanotechnology, Beethoven, and, be and nice ballerinas. Uh, uh, so Israel, after every massacre, would send its artists and, and cultural figures across the world to show Israel's quote-unquote prettier face, as the foreign ministry uh, in Israel said. That has not gone very well for them because clearly the BDS movement was not slowed, certainly was not stopped, kept growing and growing. So the brand Israel suffered quite a lot due to the BDS movement and due, we have to give credit where credit belongs, due to the far right shift in Israel. Uh, I've said this before publicly uh, and it was quoted in the media that we give credit, a lot of credit to the Netanyahu government actually for helping B BDS get to where it is today. Without him, we couldn't have made it this fast. Uh, another aspect of BDS is uh, the faith communities. Kairos Palestine is a major Christian uh, um, um, uh, theological document that was issued in 2009 by representatives of almost all Christian, not almost, all Christian denominations in Palestine. Uh, if you know Palestinian Christians, they hardly agree on anything. 
we have two Easter's, three Christmases, God knows. Uh, but <laughs> on this, we, we, we reached a consensus among most important representatives of denominations uh, supporting uh, BDS as one of the main responses to Israel's system of injustice. This opened the door to a lot of faith communities work on BDS with a slogan that silence is complicity. You cannot just say, I don't care. If your money is invested in companies that are enabling Israel's regime of oppression, you're involved. You cannot just uh, ditch your responsibility and say, I don't care. So silence is complicity. Uh, several churches have moved in the direction of, uh, uh, of doing something to varying degrees to end their complicity. They're not there yet, but they've done something to end their complicity in Israel's violations. Uh, the United Church of Christ, the Presbyterian Church, United Methodist Church, the Mennonites, and the United Church of Canada to various degrees adopted certain divestments, uh, certain selective boycotts of settlement goods, and so on. The Quaker Friends Fiduciary Corporation was ahead of everyone, where they divested, they actually divested the fiduciary funds from Caterpillar, HP, and Veolia because of their occupation, uh, occupation involvement. Norway's YMCA and YWCA endorsed fully the BDS call. So I said the Presbyterian Church last year adopted a divestment from HP, Caterpillar, and Motorola Solutions, and that was a huge success. The United Methodist Church, which is moving much slower, uh, adopted a divestment from G4S, the security company that I, I mentioned, but our partners within the United Methodist Church are doing excellent work to raise awareness within the church on this. So BDS has gone mainstream. Uh, no one can deny that today. Even the Israeli government does not deny that today. It's no longer on the fringe as it was maybe seven, eight years ago. This year, we are marking the 10th anniversary of the BDS movement, and it's, um, it's pretty accurate to say we, we've reached the mainstream. The academic mainstream, the cultural mainstream, increasingly the economic mainstream. In fact, Israel today considers BDS a, quote, strategic threat to its regime of oppression. In 2013, they started doing that. Israel assigned overall responsibility for fighting BDS to the Ministry of Strategic Affairs after the Foreign Affairs Ministry did not succeed very well in stopping BDS, so they considered it a strategic threat. And now the Ministry of Strategic Affairs handles the fight against BDS with a, a, a much bigger budget and, and very intrusive forms, uh, tactics like espionage, uh, legal warfare against BDS, and so on. Netanyahu, on his APAC visit last year, 2014, mentioned BDS in his speech 18 times, second only to Iran, as the biggest threats to Israel uh, today. And without any sense of irony, ended saying, of course BDS is a nuisance, it doesn't affect anyone. Uh, Tsipi Livni, who was a minister in government then, said the boycott is moving and advancing uniformly and exponentially. Those who don't want to see it in Israel will end up feeling it. But even more importantly, Shabtai Shavit, uh, not a lefty by any standard, he was the former head of Mossad, Israeli uh, external intelligence for several years, a very respected figure in the intelligence community in Israel, said, we're losing the fight for support for Israel in the academic world. An increasing number of Jewish students are turning away from Israel. That's always a theme in Israel's uh, concern about BDS, that younger Jews are turning away from blind support to Israel and increasingly supporting BDS against Israel. The global BDS movement, Shavit, Shavit said, has grown, and that's uh, very alarming to him. Let's see some figures to, to show why the Israeli establishment is so concerned. The BBC Globescan poll, an annual poll of international public opinion, in 2014 and even the years before it, has consistently shown Israel competing with North Korea in popularity. Imagine. Israel spends billions, literally billions, on, on propaganda. North Korea spends zero, but they're competing in popularity on the fourth worst perceived country in the world. In, in international public opinion. And this is not just in the so-called global south. Even in West, main Western countries, like Britain, 72% view Israel mainly negatively. In Germany, Germany 67%. France, 64 Spain, 61% view Israel negatively. 
And of course, in the US, it's not as rosy, but there's a steady shift away from blind support to Israel. I'll just give you a few figures from very recent polls in the United States, including a 2015 CNN poll, by the way. Two thirds of Americans prefer neutrality in the so-called Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Two thirds. You might think that a majority of Americans are completely pro-Israel. They prefer that the US stays neutral in this conflict, two thirds. And under 50, Americans under 50, 75% prefer neutrality. Four out of 10 Americans support sanctions against Israel. I'm sure no one has heard this. 40% of Americans, approximately 30 some percent, support sanctions. The highest community is the Latino community, where 44% support sanctions against Israel. Almost half uh, Latinos in the United States support sanctions against Israel. So, so those are the communities that we need to bridge with, that we need to work with. They're the communities that understand injustice the most and that we need to connect with. Young Democrats support, more young Democrats support Palestinians than support Israel today. Imagine, under 29 Democrats. Women, African Americans and Hispanics, as the polls call them, uh, uh, there are more of them who support Palestinians than the rest of society, sorry. Uh, the percentage of women, African Americans and Hispanics that support Palestinians is higher than the rest of society in the United States. Even among Jewish Americans, as a J Street poll has shown, 15% of Jewish Americans in the United States support a boycott of Israel. 15%. And when, you, when they were asked about a boycott of settlements only, it was 25%. That translated into a large growth of uh, our partners, our main partners in the United States, the campaign to end the Israeli occupation, U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation, U.S. campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel, SJPs across the country, Jewish Voice for Peace, Friends of Sabil, American Muslims for Palestine, Adala New York, and many, many, many others have witnessed a, a sharp rise in membership and support in donations, especially since Gaza, 2014. And we're heading towards even rougher water for Israel. Uh, um, um, there's a lot of tension. We should not exaggerate it completely out of proportion because the establishment, your Congress, is still beholden to Israel for some reasons that you know more than I. Um, but there's clearly some tension between the US administration and the Israeli government, and we should not just let that go. We should use that opportunity to reach to the mainstream media. We're seeing some openness in the mainstream media. Since the beginning of 2014, but especially now, the mainstream US media, media is now more open to the Palestinian discourse and to the pro-Palestinian discourse. This tension between Netanyahu and, and, and Obama and the uh, skip the speech uh, campaign with some 27 Congress people uh, announcing that they will not attend Netanyahu's speech in Congress, uh, the president, the vice president, and so on, is opening a window of opportunity for us that we should use without counting too much on that. Because ultimately, Congress is paid and bought, paid for and bought by APAC, as Thomas Friedman of the New, I'm quoting him, Thomas Friedman of the New York Times said that. Uh, now, some of the arguments, and I'll end with that, uh, uh, to counter BDS, especially in the churches, we heard this quite a lot. Why divest, why do something negative? Why don't you invest in the Palestinian economy? So our main response is why or? If you're involved in something wrong, you stop doing that wrong, and then you can do something positive as well. It's not either or. In a master-slave situation, let's say, just to get the argument across, if the slave happens to be anemic, rather than just investing in improving the slave's condition, giving him or her some minerals and some vitamins, how about stopping your trade with the master? That would help the slave much more. Stop supporting the master to end this entire relationship. Don't just settle for helping the slave and, and some symptomatic uh, issues related to the injustice system. To, to make the point clearer, Martin Luther King Jr. said boycott at a very basic level is, quote, withdrawing support for an evil policy or system. So that's a very basic moral obligation. Before supporting anyone, make sure you're not hurting them. 
right? I mean, that's, that's very logical. If your money is hurting us, stop doing that before you talk about supporting us. That's the best support you can do. Stop your money from hurting us. So if your tax money is being used despite of your will, what can you do? Well, you can offset that by supporting BDS. Since your tax money is complicit anyway in the system of oppression that's oppressing us, at least you can offset that by acting to stop the investments from your colleges, institutions, trade unions, and so on. So do no harm at the very least. But what about peace? Some people say, well, BDS sounds nice, morally compelling, but you know, we want to work for peace. The oppressed are very allergic to this term, really. Throughout history of oppression, peace means absolutely nothing if divorced from justice. It means nothing. Actually, it's what, much worse than nothing. It means uh, uh, entrenching injustice. When, when African-Americans were told you know, we want peace between you and, and your oppressors. What does that mean? How about ending oppression so that we can have real peace? Peace based on justice, not peace based on surrender to injustice. That's the key difference. So again, going to a master-slave relationship, that's not a relationship that can ever lead to real peace, ethical peace. It can lead to submission, but not peace. And even if the master is a bit nicer and expecting the slave to be a bit happier, that's still peace without justice. So it's still unethical peace. As Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa said, a very, very important remark he said to Congress, by the way, in the 80s, we do not want our chains comfortable. We want them removed. Congress was discussing how to make apartheid a bit more palatable, a bit, a bit better, to improve apartheid. And he told them, no, we want your help to break to end apartheid, not to improve it. Neither do we seek revenge. We're very clear in the BDS movement that we seek justice, not revenge. We don't want to reverse roles. We don't want to become the oppressor. We want to end oppression for everyone. The last argument is anti-Semitism. That's the most important smear, at least in this country and a few other European countries. And it's very important to distinguish between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Opposition to the Zionist ideology, which is a racist ideology that is exclusivist, that discriminates against Palestinians, uh, uh, that cannot be equivalent to anti-Jewish racism. The BDS movement categorically, consistently rejects every form of racism, including anti-Semitism. In fact, making the argument that a boycott of Israel is automatically anti-Semitic is an anti-Semitic statement because it assumes that Israel and world Jewry are one and the same. If you boycott Israel, you're boycotting the Jews. <coughs> making all Jews in, in, into one monolithic group represented by Israel is a very anti-Semitic statement. There is no the Jews. There's human diversity among Jews like there's human diversity among any group. Putting all Jews in one basket is anti-Semitic. Regardless what comes after the Jews are, you can say the Jews are smart. That's an anti-Semitic statement because you're putting all the Jews in one basket. So there are many Jewish groups that have come out in support of BDS. A few days ago, Jewish Voice for Peace has officially endorsed BDS. They've done a lot of BDS work. It did not register in the media because JVP has been associated with BDS for years now. They've been doing BDS work for many years, but now they've actually officially endorsed the full BDS call that was issued by Palestinian civil society. And across Europe, uh, uh, several Jewish groups have also endorsed BDS. Uh, uh, during the attack on Gaza, 350 Holocaust survivors descendant and descendants condemned Israel's massacre and called for BDS. This was in an ad in the New York Times run by the International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network. So to end, just the three main operational principles of BDS, and we can discuss that more in the, in the question and answer period, is context sensitivity, which means we defer to activists in any, con in any uh, circumstances to decide what best to boycott and how best to form alliances. We do not tell partners in, in Washington state, oh, you should boycott HP or you should not boycott this. They know best what to do and what not to do. We work with them, we, we have certain guidelines, but we work with partners. Gradualness, we cannot jump from A to Z. We've got to go one step at a time and build on our successes. 
And that's why we need sustainability. We need to sustain victories. When Evergreen uh, Student Council passed the divestment resolution, are we sustaining that victory? Are we building on it? Are we moving from that step to a higher uh, step towards an actual divestment by, by, by the college? Uh, I heard it's connected to Washington uh, University, University of Washington, because of the pension funds are connected. So how are we connecting with the struggle at that university to make sure that the entire pension fund is actually divested? That's what gradualness and sustainability means. So to end, BDS, above and beyond everything I said, unites and empowers Palestinians and people of conscience everywhere in the world. Uh, today, the South African uh, um, uh, jurist, John Dugard, says Palestine today is the litmus test for human rights in the world, as South Africa once was. With your help, we are reaching our South Africa moment. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm with uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, by the way. Uh, could you clarify what you mean by distinguishing between boycotting academic institutions and boycotting academics? Sure. Uh, unlike the South African academic boycott, which some people forget, the South African academic boycott was a blanket boycott against every single academic and every single institution in South Africa. And many people who supported that then are saying, oh, we cannot support the academic boycott of Israel. Well, the academic boycott of Israel that Palestinians have called for is institutional, which means we do not target individual academics. We target their institutions. Uh, so if Evergreen invites an Israeli professor uh, to teach a sociology class, let's say, fully paid for by the college, not by any Israeli institution, nothing in the, in the boycott call prevents her from coming to teach here. The boycott does not apply to that individual academic. Uh, um, and there are many, many other examples. Producing research together, traveling, Israeli academics can participate in the world academic community without any problem from the boycott movement. What we're calling for is a boycott of their institutions because research has shown all Israeli academic institutions are deeply, deeply uh, complicit in planning, implementing, whitewashing, and justifying Israel's regime of oppression. They're playing a very important role in that regime of oppression. So that's why we call for boycotting the institutions, not the individuals. Yes, sir. Well, how do you boycott the institution if you permit the Israeli academics to come and go and teach and so forth? And so forth? Where do you actually do any boycotting of the institution? You boycott institution links. So let's say Harvard has an exchange program with Hebrew University. We call for severing that link. Uh, if you have any kind of institutional links between US universities and Israeli universities, we call for boycotting that. We call on all Israeli academics and students to boycott Israeli universities, not to teach, not to study at Israeli universities. So just a complete boycott of the institution. Um, now, Israeli academics, on the other hand, who want to go out to any place without any institutional links, without sponsorship, without Israeli foreign ministry sponsorship or funding. They just want to go out and, and participate in academic uh, events. Nothing in the boycott prevents them from, the, from doing so. So as long as they're not funded by Israel, the boycott would not apply. <coughs> um, funded to go out. So let's say if, um, if there's a conference um, um, at Columbia University, and it's co-sponsored by the Israeli consulate in New York because it's funding the participation of Israeli professors to come to that conference. The conference is boycottable because there's an institutional involvement. But the fact that an Israeli academic back in his or her university is funded by the state does not uh, 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 justify a boycott per se because they have to work at their universities. They have no choice as taxpayers they, they, they work in that society. We don't, call for, we don't call on Israelis to boycott their universities. That doesn't apply. Yes, there was one in the back and then here. Yes, go ahead, sir. Oh, well, I was really heartened to hear you uh, say the most uh, basic of the demands is the uh, right of return. But that also seems like the most irre irreconcilable of the demands. So without jumping steps, how does BDS <coughs> see the relationship between its aims and actually going, I mean, unless you think that the, the BDS movement itself is going to 
be the motor to, uh, to make these changes. Uh, and I do this in the context of saying that, you know, or asking, I guess, if there's an analysis or a critique of uh, Martin Luther King and, and uh, the rest of these uh, people who's, who seems, the results seem to have felt particularly short, uh, Mandela uh, and uh, Gandhi in particular. Uh, so how do you see that, that development from BDS to the actual change? Okay, BDS is not the Palestinian National Liberation Movement. It's a strategy of resistance and a strategy of solidarity. It's one form of Palestinian resistance and the key form of solidarity with the Palestinian struggle for freedom, justice, and equality. Having said that, the BDS National Committee, the BNC, the largest coalition in Palestinian society, which leads the global BDS movement, is absolutely neutral on the political questions beyond its mandate. So it sticks to ending the occupation, ending apartheid and the right of return, and does not take any positions outside that mandate. So we don't take a position on one state, two states. We don't take a position on negotiations. We don't take a position on anything beyond our mandate, because this is an enormously large coalition. We cannot agree on much beyond the three basic rights, uh, which means that we do not see the BDS movement as the only motor leading to justice for the Palestinians, but certainly a very important one. Uh, and we're not shaping the political agenda of the Palestinian people. Palestinian political parties and, and other players do that. Uh, in the BDS movement, it's a strategy of resistance and solidarity. So you would not part with the political... Uh, N no. The political parties are represented in the BDS movement, but we do not associate ourselves with any political party or any political agenda in the, for that matter. Political in, in that narrow sense of politics, of course. Yes, ma'am. How can uh, the American activist answer succinctly those who accuse us of hypocrisy since the United States was founded on um, dispossession, colonization, genocide? It's a very important question, and that's what I meant by cross movement uh, connections, cross movement uh, uh, work, uh, intersectionality. Um, we need to tie the struggle for Palestinian justice with the struggle, struggles for justice within the United States, the domestic agenda. So um, it's not like American supporters of BDS are only doing BDS. Many of the same activists are doing a lot of progressive work or liberal work on the environment, on LGBTQ, on, on feminist issues, anti-war, uh, Latino rights, African American, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, it's a connection of the struggles. It's not either or. Second, as, as one uh, mother of an activist in the UK told us, she said, my son was never involved in anything. I mean, like his generation, completely apathetic. It's what kind of beer he'll drink and what party he'll go to. You know, typical individualism in Western society. With BDS, he's discovering activism, period. So the first thing he's becoming an activist in is Palestine. But through Palestine, he's learning about activism writ large. So now he's more involved politically in other issues domestic, domestically. Uh, uh, workers' rights, trade unions, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that comment is, is, is very important because we're seeing that. Uh, uh, many young people are, are cutting their teeth, so to speak, in the issue of Palestine, as I personally cut my teeth in the issue of South Africa. When I went to school at Columbia, I was active in the anti-apartheid movement. And many people wondered, you're Palestinian, don't you have enough? I mean, to worry about. Why are you active with, with the anti-apartheid, South African anti-apartheid movement? And I said, it's natural. I mean, wh whatever happens in South Africa affects me, and, and that's a case of injustice that I feel obliged to support. So it's connecting the struggles, it's not uh, either or. The second point is that the US has a very uh, special responsibility towards the Palestinian people because our oppression has made in the USA written all over it. It's thanks to your Congress, your tax money, that Israel can op oppress us, occupy us, ethnically cleanse us, and kill us, literally, and get away with it. Because the US is the funder, the protector, the enabler of Israel's oppression. So that engenders, that creates a special responsibility by US citizens. It's your tax money. I know you don't control where your tax money is going, but there's a moral responsibility to act because your tax money is enabling this injustice. And of course, this applies to many injustices across the world where US uh, marks are <laughs> very visible. Um, I just wanted to let um, students here know that it was, I believe in 2010, when nearly 80% of the students 
student body voted in support of divesting from companies that profit off the occupation. And you mentioned a number of um, campaigns on different campuses that have supported divestment. How do you suggest, or what are uh, some examples of success of student votes actually leading to their uh, colleges or universities divesting? We haven't seen any of that yet. It's too early. Uh, as I said, I was involved in the South African anti-apartheid movement uh, at school at Columbia University, and it took forever to, to get the trustees to sell off their shares in companies enabling South African apartheid. It took a very, very long time. Uh, now it might be as difficult, despite the ease of the internet, access, communication, and so on, makes life easier for activists. Today, Evergreen passes a resolution, and in Gaza, they'll know about it, and in Tokyo the next day. So that, that, that uh, technological revolution has helped a lot in the BDS movement. But the stakes are much higher. The enemy is, is a much tougher one than South African apartheid. It's Israel, with its near control of Congress when it comes to the Middle East issues. Uh, and that's not an easy thing to challenge. So we have no hope for Congress suddenly waking up and becoming moral. We need to pressure from the grassroots up. And we have no hope from any university administration suddenly deciding to do the right thing and to be on the right side of history without a lot of pressure. And sometimes those administrators are good hearted. It's, it's, it's not uh, 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 that you know, all of them don't care. Some of them really care, but they can't. The political stakes are enormous. Imagine the administration of Evergreen considering divestment, con even considering what would happen to a state college like that. Imagine what the lobby would do. So without massive grassroots pressure, they cannot. So sometimes they need that pressure to justify any positive steps that they take. Yes. Um, what do you say to uh, what methods or uh, practices do you have in trying to influence more of working, um, less uh, privileged, like working class families in the media uh, For those who couldn't hear, how to include uh, less privileged uh, working class families and so on in the BDS movement. Um, uh, thanks for the question. As I said, it's very important to connect it to your own struggles because we do not expect a working family in this country suffering from so many issues uh, with, with cutting social uh, uh, benefits and, and, um, uh, and so on and so forth to leave everything and just dedicate their time to fighting for Palestinian justice. We've got to see the connections. That's why Ferguson, for example, they saw the connections. Activists, African-American activists, young activists in, in Ferguson, some of them visited Palestine. I met with them uh, a couple of weeks ago. One of the most inspiring groups you can ever meet. What a mix of groups, not just African-Americans, but predominantly African-Americans, Latino-Americans, Arab-Americans, Jewish-Americans. It was such a mix. And it was such a refreshing discussion to, to see, to explore uh, the commonalities, to explore how fighting injustice there and here are connected. Our enemies are very well connected, so it's time we connect as well. It's a very common enemy. Large, savage capital, uh, the war machine, the homeland security and the military in, uh, industry, uh, uh, the oil companies and so on, the banks, that's the enemy everywhere. That's what's keeping Israel's system going and that's what's keeping the US injustices going. So once we discover that, the commonalities in our struggles, it makes life much easier to connect. And it's not an opportunistic support. So for example, Palestinians who expect uh, um, Asian Americans to support their struggle without giving anything back to the struggles of Asian Americans would be very opportunistic. It, we, it's a two-way street. We struggle together against the common enemy. Yes, sir.
Sure. As I said, the BDS movement does not venture into that territory. We want the end, of the, end, end to the occupation, end to apartheid, and the right of return. Beyond that, we do not take a position. Some of us support a one-state solution, a democratic state for all, where Jews and non-Jews, Palestinians, everyone, have equal rights. Every person in that country, including the refugees who are kicked out, can come back and everyone can enjoy equal rights. Most uh, entities within the BDS National Committee in Palestine support a two-state solution, a, a division of the country, uh, two, two states. Regardless, in a two-state or a one-state solution, all three basic rights need to be respected. Um, no one calls for kicking anyone out of the country. I mean, no one in the BDS movement, no, none of the entities involved in BDS, whether you support one state or two states, there's always some form of coexistence. So no one is calling for no coexistence. It's what form of coexistence? What form of ethical coexistence? To me, ethical coexistence means, means equal rights. Everyone has equal rights, irrespective of, of identity. Uh, um, that's what many are pushing for, having equal rights for all, regardless of what, in what political uh, constellation you may have uh, at the end. So no one is calling for an exclusivist, uh, reactionary type of uh, solution that would exclude uh, the other. As I said, we do not seek revenge, we seek justice, which is quite different. And another point is that, unlike Europe, our part of the world, the Arab region, did not have massacres and pogroms against Jews. Jews coexisted normally as Arabs in our region. They were doing very well in, in various fields. Uh, in Andalusia, during Muslim slash Arab rule of Spain, uh, Jewish culture reached its epic, reached its height under Islamic Arab rule. So there was no, nothing compared to Western Europe and Eastern Europe. The pogroms and the racism and the anti-Semitism, that's a very European disease that is slowly creeping to our part of the region, but that only became after Zionism and the State of Israel were created, not before. My grandmother had a Jewish uh, neighbor and she hardly remembered that she was Jewish. There was no discriminatory issue, whether they're Jewish or not. It's after Zionism that the issue started. We have to finish. Thank you.